of the blessings of being in a multi-generational church is that we get to enjoy uh, the fruit that each generation brings. We get the wisdom of the elder generations as well as the, the vibrancy of the younger generations. And one of, that con one of those contributions which we get from the younger generations, Generation Z, is the innovation which they provide to language. They're, they're always doing new things with language. Um, I admit sometimes I'm not always thrilled with this, typically because I don't always know what they're saying. <laughs> but it's interesting, to say the least, they, they take words and they use them in new ways. They, they don't exactly recycle them, they upcycle them. So they take something like sketch, which you probably know means to draw roughly or crudely, and they make it mean suspicious. So something is sketch if it is suspicious. And suspicious is no longer suspicious, it's just sus. So... You're always learning something new. Casey, who works with the youth, he knows these things already. And they take the word cringe, which means to, like, buckle up in fear or revulsion. And that doesn't mean that anymore. It just means something that's not pleasing. So if your food is cold, it's cringe. Or if somebody says something that's not pleasing, it's cringe. <laughs> Casey knows this. Alexa's nodding. She knows. Okay? So, now that I've told you this, I want to talk to you about something that... I, okay, I'm, I admit I'm kind of projecting. Okay? Because I think that some people feel there's an aspect of our service that is a bit cringe. Okay? Now, I don't think this, but I think other people think this. And I think this because people have told me this, not in so many words, because they're too old to use the word cringe. But that's how I interpret it, because I have kids and they use these words all the time. And I want to talk to you for a moment about the Nicene Creed. And right now, everybody just kind of cringed. But don't worry, I'm not going to do some big teaching on all of the theological aspects of the creed, because we might be here till the Jags actually win a game. Mm. Mm. Yeah, go Jags. Cringe, indeed. And I'm not going to do a teaching on the historical development, because that's not really appropriate for a sermon. What I'm going to talk about is the worship aspect of the creed because that's what we're here to do today we're here to worship and i have this feeling because people have talked to me about this that they feel that the creed and i know this isn't applying to you but others have come to me and they say that it feels like a real big speed bump in the middle of our service we've we've had wonderful time of praise and worship with music. We have listened to the word of God. We've had hopefully a really good sermon. And right before we get to the Eucharist, then we all stand up and say some words that, you know, it takes us a really long time. And, and, you know, it's all long thing. It's not really long. It's like a minute tops, but it feels awkward. You know, the people who are watching at home, it's when they go get their coffee freshened up, maybe have a Danish. You know, it feels like a road bump, like a, like a speed bump. Like a, it's just, so why do we do this? Why is it important? Why is it in a worship service other than somebody says it's a rule? Now, keep in mind, I'm a rules guy. And so if it's a rule, I'm going to follow it. But there's more than just it's a rule because I'm also just a little bit of a rebel. And if it's a dumb rule, I don't like it. But this isn't a dumb rule. It's a good rule. 
okay? Because the creed is important, not just because a bunch of people made it up a long time ago and they said, hey, this is something we should do, and some other people said, hey, it's a rule, you gotta do this every Sunday. This is important, and I wanna tell you why. Okay, there's a couple of reasons. And first, I wanna take you back to a wonderful time, the 80s, okay? I wanna take you back to a wonderful time in my life. This time when I saw this wonderful cinematic masterpiece, The Karate Kid. <laughs> or as they call it now, Cobra Kai season zero, okay? Now, I assume that most people know this, but in case you don't, it's a story of this poor soul who migrated south from New Jersey uh, to California and became this fish out of water where he was bullied by those horrible locals in California. No offense, anybody who's watching from San Clemente. <laughs> Picked on by all of the locals, he found the guy from Happy Days who happened to know karate and taught him this. And except he didn't teach him karate, he taught him how to take care of his house and to take care of his cars. And for weeks, he had him painting his fence, sanding his deck, waxing his cars, and doing it in a really particular, really obnoxious way making sure that he did it in a very obsessive compulsive way, very deliberately. And after weeks of doing this, this teenager finally has this meltdown and goes off on his mentor, which is the most unrealistic part, the idea that he could go weeks before he had a meltdown when a teenager, but never mind that. <laughs> Sorry, teenagers. And having witness this teenager have a meltdown in front of him, the old man s tells him to paint the fence or sand the floor or something like that. And it turns out that these motions that he's been having him do repetitively for weeks on end are actually the motions to block punches and kicks and etc. And there's this light bulb moment where the kid realizes, wow, he knows karate, okay? It's this great moment. The, the music that they play in the background is really epic, and everybody is like, ah, it's great, okay? And this is an embodiment of this concept that athletes know as muscle memory, okay? That you do something over and over and over and over and over and over and over again so that when you get into that intense moment in the game, you don't have to think about it. Okay? You just have it. It's just there. It's a reflex. It's there. Right? There are all sorts of athletes who just reflexively take the shot, sometimes when they're not supposed to, because they practice it so many times that it's just reflex to them. Okay? This is part of what the creed is. We say this over and over and over to impart this into our spirit, okay? In a way, this is something called a sacramental. Now, uh, you all know, hopefully, what the sacraments are, all right? We have seven of them. We have baptism, we have confirmation, the Eucharist, holy orders, uh, we have uh, marriage, we have last rites, we have confession. I'm sure I left one out, but... I think I got all seven of them. But on top of that, we have these other things that are called sacramentals, all right? And sacramentals are things that also impart grace. They are signs and symbols that impart grace. They may not be the sacraments exactly, but they remind us that God is working through us. And the Nicene Creed is in a way a sacramental. Because as we recite this over and over, we go through this practice of imparting spirit memory to ourselves. 
we remind ourselves of these truths over and over again, and we write these on our spirits. So that when crisis hits, we're not left, un we're not left unprepared. We don't have to go try and figure out what we need to think, what we need to believe. Now, this is not something I'm just making up, okay? In Deuteronomy chapter 11, speaking through Moses, God says, It shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then you will give the rain for the land and its season and the early rain and the latter rain, that you will, I will send your field, your livestock, that you may eat and be filled. Take heed to yourselves, lest you be received, deceived and turn aside and serve other gods. Therefore, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hands, and they shall be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall write them on the door so, doorposts of your house, on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land in which you swore to your fathers, to, I swore to your fathers to give them, like the days of the heavens above the earth. Now, of course, he's talking about the covenant. He's not talking about the creed, okay? But what is the creed? The creed is what we believe about God who's acted in history. The creed is a summary of what God has done. Right? So, in Deuteronomy, God is saying, teach your children what God has done. Now, of course, we're all called to teach our children about Scripture. That's a big book. There's a whole lot that we're called to teach our children. And we have a summary of that in the creed that we recite over and over again. Now, the Jews didn't teach their children. Well, they did teach their whole children. But they, they weren't called to teach them the whole law. All They have on their doorposts this little ornament. It's called a mezuzah. And that's part of how they fill out this, or fulfill this scripture, this obligation. They didn't have the entirety of scripture in that. They had a component of scripture that reminded them. They had a few verses wrapped up on a really tiny scroll that was inside that, and then they put it on their doorpost. And then when they would go in, they would, touch, they would kiss their hands and touch it. And that was a reminder to them about their obeying the covenant. The creed is a summary of what God's done and who he is. It's a reminder that he is God Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. It's a reminder of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. That he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he died and rose again. All right, this is a reminder of who he is and it is ingrained on our soul and we say it over and over again to impart that into our spirit that when the crisis comes, it's there for us. And there is another reason that is important and it is another sacramental aspect and that is the creed helps graft us and make us more aware of our community. Okay? Now, granted, we are grafted into the body of Christ by virtue of our baptism and by virtue of participating in the body and blood of Christ. But the creed makes us more aware of that. It imparts that sense of community to us. And I think that is even more significant today because I want you to be mindful of something. For 1,600 years, people have said the Nicene Creed or words very, very similar to it. 
language changes here and there, whether it was Greek or Latin or some translation into English. For 1,600 years, people have said this. Sometimes on their deathbed. Sometimes they didn't get a bed because they were about to be executed. Sometimes it was in the arenas and the coliseums as they were being fed to lions. This is how they defined themselves as they were facing extreme persecution. Sometimes this is how they defined themselves as they were facing persecution from the government and they found themselves in jails. As they found themselves in times of famine and plague and pestilence. As they thought their world was ending, they identified themselves as Christians and identified themselves by this. They claimed this as their credo. In fact, that word credo means I believe. It's where we get it. Credo in unum Deum. I believe in a one God. Catherine, that's your Latin for the day. And as we find ourselves in a world that's racked by plague, we can sit there and say, I am not, nor have I ever been alone. Not just because I have God with me, I have Christ inside of me, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me. But I am surrounded by the communion of saints. This was never more real to me than when a brother priest from another denomination lost his child to cancer. It was brutal. It was agonizing. Pray God, none of us ever experienced this. It was agonizing beyond my ability to express. But as I was at the funeral, and participating in the liturgy which was different from ours, I was reminded of the fact that for centuries, people who had lost children had prayed those very same prayers. And they, the grieving parents, were buoyed up by the fact that they were surrounded by a company that had been through exactly what they had. Not necessarily there in that room, although there were hundreds of people who were supporting them. But there were thousands of people who were supporting them in the communion of saints. And when we pray the Nicene Creed, and when we say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, that's not just the people in this room or the people in this denomination or the people who believe in Christ that are alive today. It's the people who have professed Christ throughout the ages. And if you really want to get mind-blowing, it's the people who are going to profess Christ beyond our lives today. It's the people who will profess Christ. We believe in the one church throughout all ages, the universal church. And whatever it is that we're going through, we cannot deceive ourselves into thinking that we're going through it alone. Because we join with the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven when we worship him. And they join with us. And we are a fellowship of believers. And we join with each other. And as we see in the epistle to the Hebrews, we're told, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. 
And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Whatever it is that we're going through, and in this day and age, it seems like we're going through a lot. There's all sorts of unrest. Of course, our brothers and sisters in Africa and in China, they're going through a lot too. Our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan are going through unimaginable crises that boggle the mind. They don't go through it alone because we profess that we are part of a church that is universal beyond the natural, that is heavenly. And as we profess that, we write that truth on our spirit so that when the crisis comes, when we're afflicted by this present darkness, we're not crushed by it because we're buoyed up by the truth that we are surrounded by that cloud of witnesses who have endured through the end, that did put aside every weight that ensnared them, that carried their cross to the end and triumphed over the circumstances because they did accomplish all things through Christ that was their strength and they triumphed and having died with Christ they were risen in glory with him and having done so we can do so as well and it's why we can also profess this creed and be mindful of the fact that we have as the author to the epistle of the Hebrews says in another place, this hope as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. And as we read this creed, as we profess it together, we cast that anchor and we make it even deeper in our soul. So while it feels like a road bump in our service, like a speed bump that disrupts one part of the service and prevents us from going on to the other smoothly. I say it's not the case. I say this is an impartation of grace that reminds us who we are, not just for today, but for all eternity, and not just who we are as individuals, but who we are as a community, and reminds us of our call because that great cloud of witnesses has gone before, didn't just sit in their pews. They went out and they spread the gospel. They accomplished incredible things. They worked signs and wonders and miracles, and they spread the gospel, even in times of famine, even in times of plague, even in times of pestilence, even in times of political unrest, even in their jail cells, in their prison cells, and we're called to do the same, maybe even to do better, because we stand on the backs of giants and are called to use them to move forward because they are praying for us. And so this is not just the opportunity to go get coffee. This is not just the time to stand up and stretch your legs and work out that little kink that you've gotten in my sermon, which maybe ran on a bit long. <laughs> it's the time to be strengthened in our faith, to do the work which God has called us to do. May we have the grace to live it out in our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hey, this is Father Scott Looker with Church Messiah. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and you got something out of it, please click the like button below. And also, you can click the subscribe button to get notifications in your inbox when we post other videos in the future. You can click the little bell below and you'll get uh, notifications also. 
So do that and uh, we'd appreciate it. So thanks, God bless you, we appreciate it. Uh, pray for us and we'll be praying for you. God bless you.